Okay, welcome back. In this video, we will continue our video series on medical terminology. Uh, this video will discuss chapter number seven, uh, blood, the lymphatic system, and immunology. Uh, first, the learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, define and spell the word parts used to create terms uh, for the blood, for the lymphatic system, and immunology. Uh, break down and define common medical terms for symptoms, diseases, disorders, procedures, and treatments associated with uh, the blood, uh, the lymphatic system, and immunology. Build medical terms from the word parts associated uh, with the blood, uh, lymphatic system, and immunology. And lastly, uh, pronounce and spell common medical terms associated with uh, the blood, the lymphatic system, and uh, the immune system. Uh, first, we'll start off with some uh, anatomy physiology word parts for these systems. Uh, the first one, adeno or adeno is a reference to gland. Bacterio is reference to bacteria. Blasto, this term is a reference to a sprouting or an, an embryo or a developing cell layer. Erythro is reference to red, such as an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. And hemo or hemato, both of those reference uh, the blood. Immuno references the immune system. Leuco is another term for white, such as a white blood cell will be a leukocyte. Sometimes you'll see it spelled with a C, sometimes you'll see it spelled with a K. Lympho is reference to the lymphatic system or lymph in general. Patho is references uh, disease. And spleno references the spleen. Throm or thrombo is reference to a clot, a blood clot. Uh, thym or thymo is reference to the thymus gland. And tox or toxo is a reference to a poison. So something that is toxic is poisonous. I right, now we'll talk about some general information about blood. Now the blood is a, a combination of many things. You have the uh, liquid part of the blood. You also have a solid part of the blood. They're called the formed elements. Uh, those formed elements are red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, and platelets. And then the liquid part of blood would be the plasma. And you'll see the common abbreviations for red blood cells and white blood cells. They're RBC or WBCs. And the primary function of blood is to transport materials. It'll transport say, oxygen to cells. Then it will transport carbon dioxide and waste away from cells. All right, this image we have how a standard uh, blood smear would look under a microscope. A great majority of the cells that you would see are the red blood cells. All these would be red blood cells here. And scattered among those would be various types of white blood cells. And there are uh, five different kinds of white blood cells and they vary in their appearance, their size, and also their function. But again, a great majority of the cells you would see on any standard uh, blood smear would be the red blood cells. All right, now I'll move into uh, lymph. The lymph is a, a fluid that travels uh, throughout the body. It will carry the primary components of the immune system, such as the white blood cells and the products that they make to help uh, fight infection and to help keep you healthy. And its primary function is to uh, protect you, make sure that you don't get sick. Another function of the lymph is to recycle fluid that's found in the extracellular uh, environment and take that back to the bloodstream so it can be recycled. All right, this image we have a general overview of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system will include your lymph nodes, uh, lymph glands, the lymph fluid uh, itself. Some of the larger lymphatic organs would include you know, uh, the thymus, uh, the spleen. And this image you'll see the various uh, lymphatic vessels that are found throughout the body. And the system works very closely with the uh, cardiovascular system, help move material around the body, help to recycle the fluid. All right, now we'll talk about some uh, pathophysiology. When it comes to blood, now blood can uh, become diseased uh, from a variety of sources, either from an inherited mutation or an infection or a development of a tumor. And of course, the blood is a very important avenue for testing body chemistry. It is used as a diagnostic tool. In any given uh, blood sample, for example, the numbers of white blood cells should stay at a certain uh, ratio to one another. The numbers of uh, red blood cells compared to the overall sample should remain constant in a normal healthy person. When there's an infection or when there's an injury, these numbers get thrown way off. So knowing what to look for in a standard blood test can help you treat what is wrong. Right, here we have uh, some terms that go along with the uh, pathophysiology of blood. Uh, hematology, the study of the blood, and someone who studies in this field would be a hematologist or, or can also be called a hematopathologist. We're talking about diseases of the blood. Lymphatic diseases, uh, include infections that can overwhelm the immune response. Now, what's dangerous about uh, lymphatic diseases, they can quickly spread 
throughout the entire body. So this is why when uh, cancers spread to the lymph nodes or the uh, lymphatic system, this is when it's very, very dangerous. So it's never a good sign when any kind of disease or any kind of cancer enters the lymphatic system. Immunology, of course, is the study of your immune system and how incredibly uh, complex it can be. Uh, bacteriology is the study of bacteria. And virology is the study of viruses. All right, now we'll go over some signs and symptoms with uh, some word parts. The first one, or first group we'll talk about are the prefixes. The first one, an, means without or lacking. So anaerobic would be without oxygen. The iso means equal. Macro means large. This would be the opposite of micro. And poly means many. All right, now we'll talk about some uh, combining forms with our word parts. Bacterio, reference to bacteria. A site or cyto is a reference to cell. A erythro is a reference to red. And hemo is a reference to blood. Leuco, a reference to white. See the next term. A poecolo is a reference to irregular or uh, varied. A spleno is a reference to the spleen. A thrombo is a reference to a clot. And toxo is a reference to poison. All right, now we'll talk about some of the uh, very common suffixes that you'll find with these body systems. Emia means of the blood. The suffix ia means a condition. The ending lysis means a, a separation or a breakdown or a destruction of. And last one on here, uh, megaly means an enlargement. The osis, this means an abnormal condition. Apenia, this means a, a deficiency. And last one here, urage means a bursting forth, usually a bursting forth of blood. All right, now we'll talk about some, you know, some specific uh, conditions covering the blood and the lymphatic system and the immune system. All right, the first one on here, anisocytosis. This is a condition where a person would have red blood cells that are of different sizes. And this is very commonly found in people that have uh, anemia of some kind. You know, typically, all of red blood cells are going to be approximately the same shape and the same size. The next one, bacteremia. This is where you have uh, bacteria present in the blood. So an, an invasion of bacteria into the bloodstream. Erythropenia. This is where you have a deficiency in the number of red blood cells. This is often associated with people who have anemia. Last term on here, hemolysis. This is the uh, destruction of uh, blood cells, in particular the red blood cells. All right, here's an illustration of uh, bacteremia. In a normal blood sample, you know, a normal blood smear uh, that you look under a microscope, bacteria should not be there at all. You know, there are some things that should be in blood. There's some things that definitely should not be in blood. And bacteria is one of those things that should not be found in a blood sample. Very big indicator that something is wrong. These are the representations of red blood cells here. And these will be the bacteria. The first one here, hemorrhage. This is the escape of blood through a ruptured uh, blood vessel. Remember, hemo is a reference to blood. And then the suffix hraj is a bursting forth of blood. Leukopenia. This is a deficiency or a reduction in the number of white blood cells. In a normal, healthy person, there's a an approximate number of how many white blood cells that you should have. So when this number goes way, way down, it indicates that there's an injury somewhere or there's an infection somewhere. And the synonym for this condition is leukocytopenia. And if you were to break this term down, leuco, of course, means white. Cyto means cell. And penia, the abnormal reduction of. Leukocytopenia and leukopenia both reference the same condition, a deficiency or a an abnormal reduction of white blood cells. And last term on the slide, uh, macrocytosis. This is a condition where red blood cells are much larger than they should be. So there's a there's a standard size of a typical red blood cell. So when these get larger, there's usually a reason behind that. Poikilocytosis, or this is a condition where you have abnormally sized red blood cells in the blood. And this term is usually used when there are 10% or more of your red blood cells are abnormally shaped. Polycythemia, this is a reference to having an abnormal increase in the amount of hemoglobin in the blood. This can be caused by one of two different ways, either by having a, a reduction of the plasma in the blood, the actual liquid part of the blood, or by having a large increase in the number of red blood cells in the blood. Either one of those will increase the, uh, the concentration of hemoglobin throughout the blood. Last term here, splenomegaly. This is an abnormal enlargement of the spleen. You know, organs don't just get larger on their own for no reason. If an organ is getting larger, then there's obviously some something causing that. Thrombopenia is a abnormal reduction of the uh, thrombocytes or platelets. And platelets are 
critical so your blood is able to clot during an injury. This condition is also can also be indicated by the term thrombocytopenia. Both of those terms reference the same condition, the abnormal reduction of thrombocytes or the abnormal reduction of platelets. The next one on here, uh, toxemia, is a reference to poison within the blood. So the poisoning in the blood is usually due to a bacterial presence. Now this condition is also known by the term preeclampsia. So even though they both reference the same condition, preeclampsia is a more, more commonly used term, but they both indicate the same thing. But toxemia is a little bit older of a term. Okay, if you were to break this term down, toxo, of course it means poison, and emia means a condition of the blood, so it literally breaks down into having poison in the blood. All right, now I'll talk about some uh, diseases and disorders and word parts. Uh, first group we'll talk about the prefixes. First one, an, means without or lacking. Anna means up or apart or backward or again, and mono means one. Some combining forms, adno is a reference to a gland. Auto means uh, own or self, think of the term automatically. Botulo is a reference to the, the bacterium botulinum. The most common example of this term, of this combining form would be botulism, would be an example of uh, food poisoning. Fungo is a reference to fungus, and globin is a reference to a protein. Hemo or hermato is a reference to blood. Hydro is a reference to water. Iotro is a reference to a physician or treatment. Idi or idio is a reference to unknown. So if a disease is uh, idiopathic or the cause of that disease is not known. Immuno is a reference to the immune system being protected or being safe. All right, some other uh, combining forms. Leuco is a reference to white. Necro is a reference to death. Yeah, next one, nosocom or nosocomial is a reference to hospital acquired. You'll see this reference with an infection that is a nosocomial infection. That's something that you uh, contract while you're at the hospital. And last one here, nucleo is a reference to the nucleus of a cell. A path or patho is a reference to disease. Sept or septo is a reference to a partition, such as a, a septum. See, the next two are a reference to uh, bacteria, a certain kind of bacteria and how they grow. Uh, both of these terms reference a type of bacteria known as cosi. And they're called that because they are round in shape. That's where this part of the term comes from. And the first part of these words describe how the colonies of bacteria grow. For a staphylococci, these bacteria grow together in clusters. They look like clusters of a bunch of grapes growing on a vine. Streptococci, you still have the round shapes of bacteria, but they're growing end to end. Kind of like a, a pearl necklace, where you have one right after the other in a, in a linear form. So they both reference... Cosi, which is a round, rounded shape of bacteria, but the staphylo and strepto distinguish how they grow. And last term here, thymo, is a reference to the thymus. All right, some suffixes. Emia means of the blood. See the suffix genic means uh, produced by or produced in. See the suffix iil and ic both mean pertaining to or in relation to. And last one, ism, is a reference to a condition or a process. Itis means inflammation. Oma is a reference to a tumor. Osis is a reference to an abnormal condition. Pathy is having a disease. And the suffix philia means uh, loving or attraction for. So something that is hydrophilic will be attracted to water. And compare that to the suffix uh, phobia, which means uh, fearing of or repelled by. Or a substance that is hydrophobic will be afraid of water or w would repel water. Uh, phylaxis means uh, protection. And the third one on here, erratic, means uh, uh, bursting forth of, of blood, or pertaining to the bursting forth of blood. If someone is hemorrhagic, they have the condition of having a hemorrhage, which is the bursting forth of blood. Right now I'll talk about some uh, specific diseases of the, of the blood, of the lymphatic system, of the immune system. AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. This is a very serious infection where your immune system is incredibly compromised. And when your immune system isn't working, even the smallest infection can be very, very serious. It could actually even be fatal. And this is caused by uh, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. And these two are not synonymous terms. They are not the same thing. HIV is what will lead you to developing AIDS. So one is the actual virus that causes the infection. And then AIDS is the disease that could develop from that. So you could have HIV,
but never ever develop AIDS. It just depends on that person's overall health. But these two are not interchangeable terms. They are obviously related, but they don't mean the same thing. The next one, allergy. This is when your body has an immune response to any number of things. Uh, pollen, ragweed, grass, food, a dander from pets. There's any hypersensitivity that your body has. And the symptoms could be dry eyes to runny nose to uh, becoming very swollen if you have a very severe reaction. The allergic rhinitis is the technical term for hay fever. This is the, uh, the inflammation of the nose. It's where you get the rhinitis part. And this is all caused by an allergy. So this could include having a runny nose or a stuffy nose, uh, sneezing, red or itchy, and watery eyes, or swelling around the eyes. So an inflammation of the nasal passages due to an uh, allergic reaction. The allergic dermatitis is where you get an inflammation of the skin caused by a, an allergic reaction. This could be anything from uh, severe itching to redness or, or scaling. There's some common causes of this, you know, soaps or poison ivy or fragrances, anything that touches the skin and causes an allergic reaction. And last one here, anaphylaxis. This is a very severe, very serious uh, allergic reaction, and these can be potentially life-threatening if these are not treated you know, very quickly. This is the reason why people who have uh, severe allergies or should be carrying an EpiPen with them. You know, common causes of this are you know, insect stings, uh, food allergies, you know, uh, peanut allergies, you know, any number of things. But this is a very acute, very severe allergic reaction. All right, this image we have a person undergoing an allergy skin test, which is a common way to test what you may be allergic to. And you can see here these different spots are numbered. In each one of these drops, a different allergen is put on the skin to see if your body reacts to it. And if there is a positive reaction to it, then that would indicate that you are allergic to that allergen. All the terms listed here deal with different kinds of anemia. The general definition of anemia is a deficiency of red blood cells or of uh, the hemoglobin in the blood, which will lead to you know, the person being very, very pale, or very, very fatigued. But there are multiple kinds of anemia. Uh, the first one, aplastic anemia. This is a condition where the bone marrow uh, doesn't produce all three types of blood cells. So this includes red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. So you're not just involving just the red blood cells, you're involving all the different kinds of blood cells. The next one, iron deficiency anemia more of a common type of anemia. This is where the body has a inadequate number of healthy red blood cells. And it's like the name kind of indicates, there's a deficiency of iron in the blood. And iron is a necessary component of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the pigment that actually carries oxygen to cells. So the lack of healthy red blood cells leads the person to becoming very fatigued and very, very pale. See, next one, sickle cell anemia. This is a, an inherited form of anemia where the red blood cells, instead of being you know, flat and round, have a, a sickle or a crescent shape to them, which is where the name comes from, sickle cell anemia. And whenever you distort the shape of a cell, you're gonna distort its function. And the main function of red blood cells is to deliver oxygen. When you uh, distort their shape, you're gonna interfere with how much oxygen it can carry. And also, these crescent-shaped cells tend to get stuck in blood vessels. And when that happens, you're decreasing blood flow you know, to the the tissues beyond that point. So this will lead to lower levels of oxygen, which will lead to uh, the person becoming very fatigued very easily. And last one on here, a pernicious anemia. This is an autoimmune uh, condition. This is where the body can't make enough healthy red blood cells because the body can't absorb enough uh, vitamin B12. And the way you would treat this type of anemia is to make changes in your diet. We're getting a vitamin B12 supplement. This illustration, we have uh, sickle cell anemia. This is how the Normal, healthy blood cells should look flat, round, and biconcave. But with sickle cell, they turn into this crescent shape, or the sickle shape. As they travel through blood vessels, they tend to get stuck on one another. So as blood is traveling down this vessel, so you're going to impact blood flow from here down. So tissue beyond this point will lose oxygen. And this continues for too long, the tissue can start to die. And this image, we have a real, a real image of this happening. So this is the illustration. This is how it looks. In real life, you can see how these cells are bent and misshapen, and how they're being stuck right here. So not only will it impact the delivery of oxygen, it will impact the amount of blood flow in general. See, next one, anthrax. 
This is a very severe infection, a bacterial infection found in animals that can be transmitted to humans. It causes ulcerations in the skin and can lead to a type of pneumonia. Autoimmune disease this is a very generic term for any condition where your own immune system attacks your own body. So instead of fighting off foreign pathogens, it will attack your normal healthy cells because it thinks that it is something foreign. And the last one here, botulism. This is a type of food poisoning that's caused by botulinum uh, bacteria. This could lead to nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, uh, even paralysis. A communicable disease, a disease that is passed from person to person, also known as a contagious disease. That's a very common example, the cold and the flu. And the person next to you who has a cold, coughs or sneezes on you, then you become sick as a contagious disease. And next one, uh, diphtheria, a highly contagious uh, bacterial infection. It can lead to very severe inflammation of the mucous membranes that will lead to, that will impact uh, your swallowing and your breathing, lead to nerve damage, and if not treated, can lead to potentially fatal heart damage. this illustration, we have an example of diphtheria. And here we have the actual bacteria that actually cause this infection. And at first it will present as a sore throat or just difficulty swallowing. But it can become much more severe pretty rapidly. And one of the giveaways is this white coating here and here. So this is usually a good indicator that diphtheria is present. The next one, dyscrasia. And the general definition would be a an abnormal or a disordered state of the body. So when you're talking about blood dyscrasia, you're mostly talking about an imbalance of the, the elements of the blood. In a normal healthy person, there's a range of how many red blood cells there should be or how many white blood cells there should be and how many different of each kind of white blood cells there should be. When its ratios are thrown off, that means something is going on. There's an infection or an injury somewhere. So this is a pathologic uh, condition of the blood. Edema is another word for swelling. The last one on here, fungemia, is the presence of fungi in the blood or yeast in the blood. Another term used for this condition is fungal septicemia, a systemic infection of the blood caused by a fungus. Image, we have an example of edema. You can clearly tell this person's right leg is much larger than his left leg. All this swelling will be classified as edema. When you have that much fluid, you're going to have a lot more pressure on the blood vessels, a lot more pain is induced, and this type of edema is caused by the blood plasma leaking out across the walls of the blood vessel, and that fluid has to go somewhere, so it will build up and collect. Let's see the next one, hematoma. This is a, a solid swelling of blood within the tissues. Now, depending on where exactly it is, will determine its name. So hematoma is a very, so it is a general term that references any uh, swelling of clotted blood within the tissues. The next one, hemoglobinopathy. This is a inherited condition where there's a an abnormal structure in the hemoglobin of the blood. So this will impact the, the function of the red blood cell, which will lead to a decrease in the levels of oxygen that are able to be delivered to tissues. And last one on here, uh, hemophilia, another inherited condition where the blood doesn't clot as well as it should. Sometimes these are called uh, free bleeders, people who have hemophilia. There's a lack of what are called uh, clotting factors that will slow down the process of clotting. The ability to clot is still there, but it's severely reduced. So it takes a lot longer for this uh, to happen. In this image, we have an example of a hematoma. You see this person has a black eye, and what causes that, you know, the swelling and the discoloration is blood underneath the skin here. Hemorrhagic fever. Now, this is a, a broad term that covers a series of diseases that will lead to uh, fever and chills, malaise. If not treated quickly, it can lead to kidney failure and eventually become fatal. And the common trait that links all these diseases together is that they're caused by a certain class of viruses called the arbovirus. So examples of these diseases would include dengue fever, uh, Ebola, uh, yellow fever. And last one here, iatrogenic disease. This is a term given to any disease that is caused by being treated for something else. And sometimes this could be because of a an incorrect uh, dosage of medication, You're having a, a reaction to antibiotics or certain dyes for certain procedures, having organ damage due to some of uh, the medications that you're taking. Liver damage is not uncommon. Kidney damage is not uncommon for certain medications. So all of those are directly caused by treatment by a physician. So that'd be a fall under this category of disease. Uh, idiopathic disease. This is any disease that has unknown cause. You can't say it's viral or bacterial or fungal or you can't pinpoint one particular causative agent. So when you don't know 
What causes it, you can just classify it as idiopathic. Immunodeficiency, also known as immunocompromised, this is where your immune system becomes weakened. When your immune system is compromised or weakened, it can't function as properly as it should, which means you will get sicker faster and for longer periods of time. And last one here, immunosuppression. This is either the partial or the complete suppression of the immune system. This is usually used when you're talking about someone receiving an organ transplant. Now this can be uh, induced by some drugs, you know, such as you know, chemotherapy drugs. You know, if you were getting ready for a bone marrow transplant or an organ transplant, you want to kind of dial down the responsiveness of your immune system. But immunosuppression can also be caused by diseases such as uh, lymphomas or AIDS, for example. See our next term, incompatibility. This is when things don't match together properly. You'll see this term used when or someone wants to donate an organ. If the tissues, tissue types don't match correctly, then they are considered to be incompatible. The infection, this is the, the presence and the invasion of a microorganism, such as a, a virus or a bacteria. And the last one here, inflammation. This is a physical condition where a localized part of the body will become red or hot or swollen or painful. This is usually caused by an injury or an infection of some kind. The influenza, that is the full name for the flu. Very, very common viral infection. Leukemia is a progressive disease where the bone marrow will continue to make a higher number of immature or non-functioning blood cells, and in particular white blood cells. And when this happens, you get the you are suppressing the production of regular healthy white blood cells. This is a general term for a cancer of the uh, blood forming tissues like the bone marrow. The lymphadenitis this is an inflammation of the lymph nodes. It's often caused by a, a bacterial infection. All right, in this illustration, we have a comparison of normal blood versus blood with leukemia. In the circle on the left here, you have an example of how a normal uh, blood sample would look. Most of the cells you would see are red blood cells. You would have a variety of different white blood cells scattered throughout. And there's a, a legend of what all the images are here at the bottom. But when you have leukemia, you have a, a high number of white blood cells that are made, but they're immature and non-functioning. So you will see a much higher proportion or much higher rate of white blood cells. So instead of seeing you know, just a few kind of scattered around in any given sample, you will see a lot of white blood cells. So a lot more than there should ever be. So this higher number of immature white blood cells uh, greatly suppresses the production of normal, functional, healthy white blood cells. The next disease we'll cover is lymphoma. Now lymphoma is a general term that applies for uh, cancers of the lymph nodes. And this is not just one disease. This is a, a collection of diseases that fall under the, the general term of lymphoma. And lymphomas will fall into one of two broad categories. They'll either be Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now both of these involve you know, cancers of the lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell. And non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are much more common compared to Hodgkin's lymphomas. And the way you can tell which type a cancer it falls into is only done by looking at a sample of the blood under a microscope. If there's a certain type of abnormal cell present, then it's classified as Hodgkin's lymphoma. If this type of abnormal cell is not present, it would be considered non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But both of these are examples of cancers of the lymphocytes. And there are a large number of diseases, especially in a non-Hodgkin's class. Now, depending on what type of cancer it is specifically, will determine what kind of treatment that you need. Malaria, this is a blood disease that is caused by the bite of a mosquito. But it's not the mosquito bite that is making you sick. There is a a protozoan found inside that mosquito called plasmodium. And it's that introduction of that protozoan is what making you sick. So it's not the bite itself. And this can also be passed on from uh, a pregnant mother onto the child with the exchange of blood between mother and child. See next term, measles. This is an infectious viral disease as indicated by a very itchy a rash on the skin, uh, also a fever. It's common in childhood. This is why this is commonly uh, vaccinated against in the United States. The MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella. And then the term rubiola is just the formal name for measles. Now, thanks to the, the increase in vaccinations against measles, this is nowhere near as common as it used to be because this can be a very serious disease if not treated properly. And the last disease on here, mononucleosis. This is a viral disease that is most commonly known by uh, the phrase the kissing disease. And it's called that because the virus that causes this can be passed from person to person uh, through saliva 
what's happening here is there's an abnormally high proportion of monocytes in the blood. The monocytes are, be, are a certain type of white blood cell. On this picture, we have a child with measles and the very indicative reddish skin rash all over the body. All right, in this illustration, we have mononucleosis. It's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. It's going to lead to fatigue and high fever. And a good indicator of mono are the, the swollen tonsils here. And here you have an example of what the blood smear would look like. You know, abnormally high number of uh, monocytes in the sample. The uh, necrosis or necrotic. This is a into the uh, the death of most or all of the cells of a organ or of a of a tissue due to disease, lack of blood or injury. And the term necrotic is just a, a synonym for necrosis. They both reference the same condition: death of an organ due to lack of blood or injury or disease. Nosocomial infection. Uh, we mentioned this earlier in the video. This is an infection that you contract while at a hospital. So something that you didn't have before you got there. A plague. This is a very contagious uh, bacterial disease. There are multiple forms of the plague. It's not just one kind. But you can have a uh, bubonic plague or a pneumonic plague or a septicemic plague. All those have different areas of the body that they uh, impact. But they're all caused by a bacterial source. Uh, rabies. It's a contagious disease that is often passed from mammals such as you know, foxes or raccoons or dogs uh, transmitted to humans you know, through a bite. Now, if not treated, this will become deadly. There's only one known case as of you know, this video where someone contracted rabies, it was confirmed that it was rabies, and the person survived. So this is why if you are ever bitten by an animal that you don't know, go to the doctor and get treatment for rabies just as a precaution. Now, the good news is the symptoms don't present themselves for about two to three weeks. But the problem is once they do, once you are symptomatic, there is no way to fix it. So you have a, a good amount of time to get treatment for it. But this is something that you definitely don't want to waste time on. So other than that one person that we know of, if you show signs of being symptomatic for rabies, you know, this will become fatal. This will cause uh, convulsions and will cause madness. It will induce hydrophobia, being afraid of water, you know, the foaming at the mouth. All those are classic symptoms of being infected with rabies. In this picture, we have the flea that actually transmits one of the forms of the plague, bubonic plague. Now, in this flea is a bacteria, uh, Yersinia pestis. So it's not the flea that's making you sick. It's the actual bacteria within that flea. Uh, septicemia, or septic. This is a condition where you are, where you have uh, blood poisoning due to a bacterial infection, either by the bacteria or the toxins that it is producing. And septic references the same type of condition, being infected with bacteria. Our next disease, uh, smallpox. This is a contagious viral disease. It's indicated by a fever, and then uh, pustules all over the skin that will leave scars after they're healed. Now, as a disease, this was eradicated in 1979, but because of that, many people haven't been vaccinated for it since. So this represents a this represents a very real bioterrorism threat because it it is so fatal and so many people are not guarded against or not protected against it. See the next term, uh, staphylococcemia. We talked about this uh, briefly earlier. This is a reference to a particular type of bacteria, uh, cosi, which are round spherical shaped uh, bacteria. It will grow in colonies that look like uh, clusters of grapes on a vine. That's where the staphylo part comes in. So this is the presence of having staphylococci within the blood, staphylococcemia. So in a generic sense, this is often referred to as a staph infection, you know, being infected with a staph type of bacteria. See the last term on here, uh, MRSA, M-R-S-A, an acronym that stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. The S-A part of this term, Staphylococcus aureus, that is a type of bacteria. And the reason why this is so important, the antibiotic used to treat Staphylococcus aureus, methicillin, has been used for so long and used so often that many types of this bacteria have mutated and evolved, so they are now resistant to that treatment. So they are deemed methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA for short. So what used to work on them 10, 15 years ago doesn't work on them now. So you have to use a, a different medication to, to get rid of the bacteria, something stronger, something that causes more uh, side effects. 
This is something that is common with a lot of bacteria. Due to the prolonged and due to the overuse of antibiotics over the last 50 or 60 years, bacteria will mutate and evolve and become resistant to very common types of antibiotics. See, streptococemia, something else that we mentioned earlier. The coci, you know, the round-shaped type of bacteria. When they grow in colonies, they grow end-to-end, -end, like on a, like the pearls on a pearl necklace. So that's where the strepto part comes in. So this is the your blood being infected with streptococci bacteria, or streptococemia, often calls a strep infection for short. You know, being infected with a strep type of bacterium. A common example of that would be strep throat. The bacteria that causes strep throat, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, that's where that, that term comes from for strep throat. It's describing how the colonies will grow together. Tetanus. This is a bacterial disease that, if not treated, will lead to muscle spasms of the voluntary muscles. And the spasms will become so rapid that it will lead to a rigidity, so, or, or lock jaws is often called, because the muscles in the neck and the jaw will be so contracted so tightly that it looks like the jaw is locked and can't be moved. And these spasms will become so persistent they will become painful. And last term here, uh, thymoma, this is a reference to a tumor on the thymus gland. And usually this is a benign tumor. It's not that common at all. This is usually associated with the disease myasthenia gravis. So if we were to break that word down, you know, thymo versus the thymus, and of course oma is reference to a tumor. So a tumor of the thymus gland. All right, now I'll talk about some uh, treatments, procedures, devices, and some word parts. Uh, the first one, I'll talk about some prefixes. Anti will mean against. Pro will mean for. So these are opposite. Some other combining forms, many of which we talked about already. Uh, adeno is a reference to gland. Auto means self. Bio means life in general. Globin or globino is a reference to protein. And hemo or hemato is a reference to blood. The homo will be a reference to the same. Immuno would be a reference to the immune system. A lympho, lymphatic system, or lymph. A spleno, reference to the spleen. And thrombo is a reference to a clot. Our right, next, we'll talk about some uh, common suffixes. See, the suffix of crit means to, uh, to separate. The ectomy, of course, the surgical removal of. Ick means uh, pertaining to. Logis, in relation to. And last one, uh, logi, the study of. A common example is always used here uh, biology. Bio means life. Logi, the study of. So biology, broken down, means the study of life. Lysis, break down or to separate. Phylaxis, means uh, protection. Stasis, means uh, to stop or to control. See the suffix uh, therapy, means treatment. And then suffix of tick, T-I-C, means pertaining to. All right, now I'll talk about some uh, treatments and procedures of the blood, lymphatic system, and immunology. The first one, antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics are used to treat uh, bacterial infections. So given an antibiotic will only work on bacterial uh, infections. It will not work on diseases that are caused by viruses. So that's the term that's often uh, misused. So if you have a cold or a flu, you aren't taking antibiotics to get better. You're taking antivirals. An antibiotic would have no impact on the cold or a flu because those are viral infections. Antibiotics are reference to a bacterial infection. Anticoagulants. These are a class of drugs that are given to help thin the blood. And a common example of that is uh, warfarin. It's a very common agent given as a blood thinner. The last one here, antiretroviral therapy. There are many classes of viruses depending on its shape and what kind of genetic information it has, how it infects your cell, and how it replicates. And one class of these viruses is called a retrovirus. You know, a good example of that would be uh, HIV. And medications that help treat this class of viruses are called antiretroviral. All right, in this image, we have uh, someone very important in the field of medicine, uh, Alexander Fleming. He was the one who discovered antibiotics and how antibiotics would have uh, an impact on bacteria. So his research on antibiotics has saved countless numbers of lives in the last hundred years. See, next one, attenuation. In general, this term means to uh, make something weaker. And when you talk about the uh, immune system, these are how vaccines are prepared. A vaccine is really nothing more than the virus that causes that disease you are treating against. But what's done to it is it's made either uh, inactive or in a very weakened form. So you are attenuating that virus. You're making it so weak that it can't make you sick or shouldn't make you sick. But your body is able to recognize it so it knows what to fight so you don't get sick from that disease later on. Now, next term, autogalous uh, transfusion. This is when you receive a transfusion of your own blood. Some people, before they have a, a surgery, will donate their blood ahead of time 
so they know that they are receiving their own blood, not someone else's. So the same person is the donor and recipient of the blood. The next term, uh, blood chemistry. This is just being able to identify the, the numerous materials that are found within the blood. Like I mentioned earlier, there are some things that should be found in the blood and some things that shouldn't be found in the blood. And the things that are found in the blood normally should be at a, a certain range when someone is healthy. You now, red blood cells are at a certain percentage of blood. White blood cells are in a certain percentage of blood in a normal healthy person. When these percentages get thrown off, or if something is in the blood that shouldn't be there, that's an indication that something is wrong somewhere. The last term here, uh, blood culture. This is a test that's given to find if there's an infection within the blood. Taking a sample of blood and seeing if bacteria grows there, or if a fungus grows there, or something that is there that shouldn't be there. The blood transfusion is the process of transferring blood from one person to another. A bone marrow transplant, transplanting the bone marrow from one person to another. Coagulation time. These are generic tests to see how long it takes for your body to form a clot and to stop bleeding. Say for someone who has a hemophilia, for example, the co coagulation time would be much longer than a normal healthy person because their ability is greatly diminished due to the lack of clotting factors. Now some examples of this would be the PT, which is the prothrombin time, and also the PTT, the partial thromboplastin time. And both of these are just examples of gauging how quickly your blood is able to clot in response to injury. In this image, we have an example of a blood transfusion. Of course, when you get it from your own self, that is autologous. If you get blood from someone else, that is a homologous transfusion. All right, in this image, we have a bone marrow transplant. In the way it typically works, a sample of the red bone marrow is taken from the pelvis of the donor and then is introduced into the recipient's red bone marrow. All right, the next one, a complete blood count, or CBC. This is used to gauge your overall health, and what this does is it checks for the, the quality and the number of white blood cells or red blood cells and also platelets. So it's just like the name you know, implies. It's a complete blood count. How many red blood cells are there? Are they healthy? How many white blood cells are there? Are they healthy? How many platelets? Are they healthy? Hematocrit. This is a blood test that checks for the, the ratio of the volume of the red blood cells to that of the total blood volume. So normally, red blood cells should be about 45% of the blood. When that number goes uh, higher or lower, that indicates something is wrong. Uh, hemoglobin, that is a, a special pigment that's found in red blood cells. That's what enables the red blood cells to carry oxygen with the various cells in the body. Red blood count is the actual number of the red blood cells. So a white blood count would be the number of white blood cells. Again, there are multiple kinds of white blood cells, and they should be found in a certain ratio to one another and that ratio gets thrown off to indicate uh, something's wrong. And platelet count, just like the other two, is the counting of the actual number of platelets that are found in the blood. Our next term, uh, hemostasis, is the process of stopping bleeding. Hemo is reference to blood. Stasis means uh, stopping. So the overall process of your body reacting to an injury and stopping the bleeding naturally through a blood clot. Uh, homologous transfusion is someone receiving blood from someone else. So it's the same species. This is still another person, but it's a different individual. So that's why it's uh, homologous. Immunization, uh, being vaccinated for diseases. And then immunology is the study of the immune system. Immunotherapy, this is the treatment of disease by giving uh, substances that will stimulate your immune response. So basically uh, making it work faster than it normally would, making it work uh, harder than it normally would in order to combat a, a disease. Lymphadenectomy, also known as a lymph node dissection, is where you have the surgical removal of a lymph node. The last term on here, uh, prophylaxis. This is action or uh, medication that's taken to prevent a disease. So if you know you're traveling to an area of the world that has a higher rate of malaria, for example, you take medications before you leave, before you get there. That's a, that's a prophylactic procedure. You're taking medicine in advance of being exposed to a, a condition or a disease. All right, now we'll talk about some common abbreviations that you'll see regarding the, uh, the blood or the lymphatic system or the immune system. Uh, the first one, AIDS, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Uh, CBC, Complete Blood Count. HCT, uh, Hematocrit, that's the abbreviation for the blood test hematocrit. HGB, uh, Hemoglobin, 
both of those refer to hemoglobin. Uh, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is the virus that will lead to the disease AIDS. MRSA, methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, basically the bacterium uh, Staph aureus that has mutated to the point where it's now resistant to the common antibiotic treatment of methicillin. A PLT, a platelet count. PT, prothrombin time. A PTT, also related to prothrombin time, the partial thromboplastin time. Both of those are referenced to a coagulation time test. A RBC, red blood cells. A WBC, white blood cells. All right, we will end this chapter with our, our normal uh, combining form quiz. Uh, terms on the left. Uh, hemo, leuco, adeno, septo, nocosimo. They'll match up either with gland, uh, putrefying, white, hospital, or blood. So hemo, we'll go with blood. Leuco goes with white. Adeno goes with gland. Septo, the putrefying. And nocosimo goes with hospital. And here are all the terms with their correct matching definitions. And that brings us to the end of chapter number seven on the blood and lymphatic system and the immune system. We will continue our series on medical terminology with our next video on chapter number eight.